It is now my honor to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Robert Fraley. Rob is Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Monsanto. He oversees their Global Technology Division. He's been designated and recognized as the father of agricultural biotechnology. Uh, he is a recipient of the World Food Prize. He was a laureate inducted in 2013 in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm from Iowa and I was honored to be in the room when uh, Rob received that honor. He's received the National Medal of Technology from President Clinton. He is a National Academy of Science Award recipient for the Industrial Application of Science and for his work on crop improvement. Let's welcome Rob Fraley. Thank you, appreciate it. How are we doing, everybody? Good. Ah, I tell you, I've had a big day today. I got in town just in time to uh, attend the uh, STEM and Ag Council, and we did, uh, we did uh, an Ag Is Town Hall. I, I think a few of you plugged into that. That was great. And then I... Uh, well, thank you very much. It was a, it was a great program and uh, a lot of excitement. And then, I, uh, then I had a, uh, a great opportunity to uh, slip onto the Hill and, uh, and talk science with some senators and representatives who are interested in ag, and that, uh, that's always a great opportunity that I like to take advantage of. And now I, uh, I feel really relaxed here with a, uh, with a group of folks who uh, who's so passionate about STEM. And uh, where's Melissa Harper? Melissa, are you here? She probably just stepped out. Melissa is going to backstop for me in the next panel. So I'm relaxed because I know if I miss anything, she's going to clean up for me and do a great job. So um, uh, I want to shift the conversation to, uh, to STEM in agriculture and really more broadly, uh, ag and the, uh, the food chain. Uh, I would describe agriculture and food as the world's oldest industry. And it is the biggest and the last industry to modernize and digitize. So that kind of tells you where, uh, where things are going. Uh, at the same time, I always like to make the point in every audience that I talk with how important this really is. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I have a chance, and after receiving the World Food Prize, to travel around the world and meet with ag ministers and, and see lots of sites and around the food chain and food production. You know, the, the challenge, just, just for a moment, think about this. Uh, today, within the last few months, you know, the world is, uh, has turned uh, over its 7.3 billionth person. Um, by 2050, we'll have 10 billion people on the planet. A lot of those will be folks and economies growing in Asia and across Africa. The, uh, probably the most impressive number is that between now and then, three billion more people will join the middle class and their dietary patterns will change enormously. Um, we're gonna have to produce twice as many chickens as we do today and pigs and to, to feed and, you know, the challenge of food production is enormous. In fact, if you think about what the world has to do between now and 2050, we have to produce more food than we have in the entire history of the world. So this is a daunting technology challenge. And just to make it a little bit more challenging, uh, we, we need to do it with less water because agriculture uses 75% of the world's fresh water. Uh, we're gonna have to do it um, facing climate change. And we know some of the hardest hit countries will be in Asia and Africa. Um, so that's the challenge. And it's, it's very real and it, it's very, uh, very, uh, very key, but you know, I am shifting gears quickly so that you understand. I absolutely believe when we look at the incredible advances in biology and data science that we have the, uh, the tools to do that. And I have a, a, a huge amount of confidence. And uh, let me just give you a couple of facts that, that I always think about. I grew up, I was a, one of those farm kids. I grew up in central Illinois and, and uh, was one of the first to be able to go to college. And, understand biotechnology and, and come back and, and apply that toolkit. But back in uh, 1980, uh, you know, the average farmer in this country fed 70 people. Uh, today, with the shrinkage of the number of farmers, with the expansion in food demand around the world, the average U.S. farmer feeds about 150. And by 2050, is they're gonna feed 300 people. So. The technification of farming and agriculture and being able to produce more with less is, uh, is absolutely key. And at the same time, 
that's been an incredible contribution to our workforce. When my grandpa was farming in Illinois two generations ago, half the people lived on the farm. Today it's probably only one or two percent. So that improvement in efficiency has created the opportunity for, uh, for so many other industries to, uh, to grow. So I mentioned I grew up on a farm. I had a chance to go to college at University of Illinois. And, uh, and then uh, a key, like most people in the STEM world, a key experience for me was doing a postdoc out in San Francisco at the University of California, San Francisco, where the whole biotechnology industry started. Uh, Herb Boyer, just a few years earlier, had cloned the first gene. By the time I got to UCSF in the late 70s, it was already clear how the biotechnology was going to change the pharmaceutical and the healthcare industry. My passion was uh, how could it impact agriculture and crops. So I uh, took a position at Monsanto in the early 80s. Uh, within a couple of years, we had developed the first techniques for introducing new genes into plants. And uh, so um, uh, whether you like GMOs or not in agriculture, you're looking at the guy right here who, uh, who uh, you know, 15 years later helped launch Roundup Ready soybeans and, and insect protected crops. And, you know, this year we're celebrated the 20th anniversary of the technology. And I'm really proud of the fact that uh, in this country, probably 90% of the farmers use the tools. They're used by farmers in 30 other countries around the world. And they've had you know, tremendous benefits on increasing yields. That means producing more stuff for every, uh, for every acre of farmland. They've helped reduce pesticides. And uh, most importantly, they've uh, really contributed to the environment. You know, As we think about feeding those 10 billion people in 2050, you know, the easiest thing to do for a lot of people who recommend it is don't create new technology. Just double the amount of farmland. Well, we wouldn't have a planet left if we did that. I actually think with the kind of innovations that are coming that by the time 2050 comes around, we'll actually feed the world on less farmland than we do today because we will have been able to increase the yields and the productivity and be able to produce more with less. And that's really the, uh, really the goal as we go forward. So the biology advances have been incredible. You know, we know every single gene in a plant. We know their function. Uh, and now you, you all know there's breakthroughs with gene editing and CRISPR-Cas that are going to give us the ability to, to change each gene precisely. So the, the biology tools are incredible. What has blown me away as the biology guy is the opportunities that have been created now with uh, data science and agriculture. About three years ago, we acquired a company in the Silicon Valley, right in the heart of San Francisco, the Climate Corporation. What attracted us to them is they had mapped every single farmer's field in the United States. Guess how many there are? 30 million. And then they went back and they recorded and recreated the weather history on each field. And they looked at the yields and they built models that talked about how much you know, crop yield could be expected under different climactic and weather conditions. And now they've taken that to new levels with algorithms that give farmers predictable tools on how many seeds to plant per acre and how much fertilizer to use to optimize literally every meter in that field. And then you add that to the uh, explosion of satellite and drone information. You know, I, I grew up on a farm um, and I talked to a lot of farmers today and I can tell you, even in Iowa, not every farmer walks every field and looks at every plant every day. You know, But with the satellite and with the drones, they can do that. And the beauty of that is, is you get real-time information. You can make faster decisions. You can identify a problem early, fix it without maybe spraying the whole field, and you can protect a lot of yields. So the, the data science tools are incredible. You know, I, I talk about it that you know, the average new car has 5,000 sensors in it. In just a few years, every piece of farm equipment is going to have sensors to monitor moisture, nutrition, you know, the, the organic matter in the soil, provide that information to, uh, to create you know, better decisions for farmers. And the way I, I kind of describe it at a high level, if you think about a typical farmer's year, from the time they plant the seed and feed it, 
the, the crop and, uh, and, and protect and harvest it, a farmer makes 50 decisions. Each one of those decisions is now being digitized. It's being you know, analyzed and made better, in the, and that's, uh, that's incredible. So truly, uh, you know, farming has met Silicon Valley. I had the opportunity about two months ago to, to talk in the Silicon Valley, and there were 400 startup data science companies with new sensors, new satellite imagery techniques, and new ways of, uh, of helping the farmer. You know, everybody has that mental image of, the, uh, of the, the farmer and the pitchfork and the overalls, and I, I use that today. You know, today that farmer is probably managing his farm with his computer in his office, but if not, he's in a tractor that has more computer power than the first spaceships that went to the moon. And that's, uh, that's modern farming. And that's why when we come back and cycle all the way back to STEM, we need an incredible influx of, um, of talent. In fact, I think there's three things we really need to do when we think about the technification of agriculture and the food chain. First of all, we need all of us to invest more, companies, universities, and the government. And uh, you know, we had the opportunity the, the last weekend to, to make that clear how important investments in agriculture are, both from a point of view of food security, but also enhancing the environment. The second thing, of course, is just as was talked about in the panel, we need to excite and involve a lot more young kids and scientists in the STEM field in agriculture. And then the last point I would talk about, it's a lesson that I've painfully learned from, uh, from the crop GMO perspective is, doing great science is essential if we're gonna create products. But talking about it and communicating to the public and making it understandable and ensuring that the right decisions get made from a, a governance and a political perspective is key, and so education is key. So when we look at, at the opportunities in agriculture uh, from a STEM perspective, USDA, Purdue have done a survey that showed that we will be needing 60,000 new employees every year for the foreseeable future in this industry. And sadly, right now, with the fact that it's not that well known, we're not, uh, we're not probably going to fill all those. And that's reflected in the fact that when you look at the average age of scientists, you know, compared to any other industry, the, the, the rate of aging has doubled if you look at the number of scientists over 55. So we know we have a, an incredible need for biologists, for engineers, for mathematicians, for statisticians. Every aspect of what we do has become digitized from the research to the field to the production all the way to food and nutrition, and that's, uh, and that's key. So, um, you know, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's clear from the panel, uh, and you know this as well as I do, we need to start earlier. The outreach programs in, uh, in K through 12 are key, the exposures, the internships, and then, you know, I think one of the important things that was commented on, the, uh, the importance of, uh, of social media and outreach efforts. We've been a, a proud sponsor of, uh, of a lot of biology programs where we give away seeds and science kits, but also we find the, uh, the attraction of robotics, and FIRST Robotics has been a great uh, entry point for us, and also that sponsoring the, uh, you know, the hackathons and, uh, and some of the programming and coding conferences, and uh, that's key. A lot of this is available on some of the, the websites that our company provides, and Melissa will, uh, will cover it in more detail, and, and I know that, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've just seen the, uh, the website that the uh, Ag and STEM Council has put out, the, the Feed, Nourish, Thrive organization, is really cool because it's very interactive and it lets, lets people pursue a lot of their, uh, their interests. Um, so I've talked a lot about, uh, about the ag and, and, uh, and about some of the things going on. Uh, we all know that no single company is going to make a, a difference. We all have to work together here, both on the, uh, on the, uh, the education and on the uh, communication side of this. And it uh, takes a, a broad uh, you know, public-private cooperation as well as across uh, uh, industries, academics, and, uh, and governments. And uh, you know, what I end up in the end is, uh, is I think the real selling message here to young students is, um, is about making an impact. You know, I mentioned that we got into the data science space about three years ago. We acquired a company in the heart of San Francisco called the Climate Corporation who mapped those fields. And 
the, f the founder of that uh, company was a guy named David Freeberg, who was one of the Google executives involved in setting up Google Maps. And we were really worried about how would you know, a Monsanto, an ag-owned data science company in the heart of San Francisco thrive when next door they were recruiting against Google and Amazon. And, uh, and David made this point. He goes, he goes here's, my, uh, here's my interview speech. You know, you're a brilliant mathematician. You're a great statistician. You're a wonderful programmer. You can get a job anywhere you want to. But here's your choice. Do you want to create the next version of Angry Birds? or do you want to help feed the world? And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been very true. Um, and I think this generation, the, uh, the impact of using STEM to, uh, you know, for, the, for the benefit of society, and there's nothing more important than food security and enhancing the environment is a, uh, a key message. And the important thing I always like to, to make the point of, I grew up as a farm kid, and, but that's certainly not uh, an essential part. So we would like to have this young gentleman join us at Monsanto when, uh, when you get a chance and, uh, and uh, make an impact in the world. Or to quote a, a pretty good friend of mine, you may, uh, you may recognize Bill Nye, uh, you know, have the opportunity to change the world. And uh, if you get a chance, uh, you know, I, I talked a lot about communication. I had the, uh, had the privilege of working with Bill Nye on his new Netflix release that came out last weekend on uh, saving the world. And I think, you know, those are the kind of things that, you know, as we think about communicating to that next generation, social media, TV, humor, and how we make science real and, 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 uh, and, uh, and personal is a key. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to close. We'll uh, do a few uh, questions if we get a chance. And uh, we'll have uh, Melissa here to, uh, to back me up and really get into uh, the details of our, uh, of our STEM outreach. So thanks for the time and opportunity to talk. Appreciate it. So we now have an open mic, right? Wonderful job, Rob. Loved every word you said. Um, Rob, if you sort of look around the room here, we have close to 50 strategic partners. You know, I mentioned earlier before, we have uh, $2 trillion in combined revenue. We employ 6 million people. So this group here has a lot of muscle. We can do things. Do you have any idea on sort of, you know, what would a you know, top-notch initiative be or a top-priority initiative for us to collectively work on? Because right now, we're sort of all working our own thing, yep. and that's the right thing to do, don't get me wrong. But what, in, in your view, is there like one or two top priorities we could tackle together to accelerate to fill that STEM talent pipeline? You know, that's, uh, that's such a hard one. We've had a lot of conversations with many companies because we all have our, uh, you know, our vested interests in, in view. But, you know, I think one of the things that has helped us is uh, realizing that any individual that we can connect with STEM helps. And so, you know, we were a biology-based company. Um, in the last couple of years, you know, our outreach, you know, through... Um, you know, through computers, robotics has attracted a, uh, a lot of talent. So I think supporting, you know, other companies' programs has been very helpful. So we've, uh, we've worked with a number of food companies and computer companies and supported the programs they've had in place rather than create our own. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, and everybody knows it is, if we had a more systematic science program in K through 12 that we could, you know, create or fund at a, at a national level, that would be key. I like uh, a lot of the, uh, the ideas around, uh, you know, some type of, uh, of uh, social media mentoring programs uh, so you, that you can help reinforce and drive that. Uh, but I, uh, I think that uh, in many ways, you know, part of the challenge is depicting scientific careers broadly to the public that attracts students. And, you know, over the years, um, you know, probably one of the most successful things we've had going for us are programs like CSI and, you know, showing that science can be cool. Often when I talk about uh, the world of plant breeding, I, uh, I talk about it in CSI terms, you know. Something happens in the field, 
usually in a back alley in CSI, but, and then you, uh, you bring that, those samples in and you, uh, you work on them in the lab and you get that, uh, that breakthrough moment that lets you solve the crime or create the next new corn plant. But you understand, I mean, you know, socializing science in a way that, uh, that makes it fun and exciting and, and demystifies it is, uh, is right. So we need, uh, we need some more Bill Nyes, we need some more you know, popular uh, you know, TV programs that, uh, that help celebrate as well. So we can uh, get some more, uh, more visibility. It's not easy, but I, uh, I, the message I would say is, is before you start your own program, look at who already has something in place and see how you can piggyback. That, that's, for me, been one of the gems. Thanks. Other questions? Sure, over here. Hi, thanks for your, is this on? Thanks for your comments. Um, my name is Titi Laya Omiyale. Um, in the past five plus years, I had the pleasure of working under the Obama administration at both the Department of Energy and USDA. Um, and when you're talking about agricultural um, uh, STEM, STEM fields in agriculture, I wonder how much of it is a cultural thing because uh, a lot of the work that I did was uh, in marketing and basically, so it's not just you know, farming, but it's also energy in, ag you know, in agriculture and rural communities have so much space um, and so much opportunity, um, a lot more, well, as much as uh, urban communities as well. So I'm wondering what is your marketing, um, marketing strategy to get um, the greater spectrum of opportunities in agriculture? It's great, I, I think you make a key point because and you know it, it happens a lot. I'd say two two uh, two stereotypes. So sometimes agriculture immediately is farming, okay. And really, what we're talking about is the modernization of the ag and food chain all the way to nutrition and the dinner plate. And if you think about agriculture that way, it's probably the biggest employer in the country. And it's one of the, the biggest contributors to you know our trade balance around the uh, the world. So, from that part, it's, it's it's much bigger. And when you think about it, both as the the biology, the data science, and the integration of basically all of the scientific advances. I mean, we would use the same tools to discover a new gene for a soybean plant that you would use to discover the cure for cancer, or we would use the same type of programming skills to map every detail of a, of a field or a process to optimize you know, the shipment of, uh, of products around the world. So I, I think the key is to make it bigger uh, and that it's not just farming, but it's, it's food and nutrition and health. And then I think the other part of the message which is, which is really important is, and it's something I, I've learned in the last couple of years, uh, a lot of times we end the conversation around agriculture and food with uh, feeding the hungry, nutrition, and health. And what we don't realize is that to produce the food today, we are farming a land area the size of South America. And if we, again, don't farm more efficiently as we have to double the food supply, we will, we will wreck the environment on our way to feeding the world. I think if we take that as, uh, as an important objective so that the investments in innovation and in the, in the food system are as much an investment in protecting the environment as they are in food security, I think it, it, it enhances the message and it creates an even additional um, addendum to the momentum of, uh, of why this is such an important area for career pathing and for, uh, for companies to invest in. I can't think, like I said, anything more important than food security and enhancing the environment. You know, that's, uh, that's got me up to go to work every morning for the last 37 years and it still makes it very exciting because we have the technology and the tools to do it if we can harness the, the, the resources and the person power to make it happen. I think it's a really important mission. Like I said, you can save the world. Yeah, sure. All right, one last one. I'll be brief. What she was talking about was the marketing and and, uh, and Kurt Freeman from Mentor Pathways. And uh, what I keyed into that she had mentioned was the the perception of that um, on uh, in terms of the public. Uh, Monsanto's marketing has been primarily to 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 farmers mm -hmm. and for good reason. 
um, but the, the change needs to come um, uh, at, at the end customer, which is the, which is the consumer. And so I'm just interested in, in, in terms of how Monsanto could work with other companies, such as PepsiCo and others in, 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 sure. in the food business to, uh, and, to get and the you're, message And you're very right on that. I would say, you know, looking back at, you know, my company, my career, the ag industry, probably the biggest mistake we made was once we got some of these new technologies in the marketplace, we used our marketing uh, focus almost exclusively with farmers. And it really wasn't until four or five years ago that we realized that the you know, perception from consumers wasn't really getting any better and really needed a lot of work. So we, we've shifted enormously. Almost all of our, uh, our marketing efforts now is to the consumers. And a big part of that uh, in today's world is through social media. So, you know, a, a lot of the issues and the myths that got created regarding modern agriculture, you know, live and die on the internet. And that's clearly, you know, the vehicle we need to use to, uh, to solve it. And I think that's key. And, you know, we've seen a, a number of uh, food organizations, typically under the banner of uh, GMA, the Grocery Manufacturers of America, or the agricultural companies under Ranchers and Farmers Alliance and others, really band together, start to put resources in to that direct-to-consumer communication, which is so key. Because if we don't have, you know, I, I always make the point that, you know, science is critical for new products and, and the developing technologies, but it's not enough. It's insufficient. It needs that communication to build the trust so that these tools can be used. And I think building that trust is also part of attracting, you know, that next generation of workforce. Thanks. Appreciate it.